the truth about tithing. Oh, wow, it got real quiet. It got real quiet. <laughs> the truth about tithing. What you will not hear preached at your church with the exception of here because we're preaching it here. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence. We thank you for open heavens. We thank you for revelation. Spirit of revelation and understanding, be present here in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. When we talk about tithing, most of the sermons you will have heard are done with very careful preparation. I know I'm a pastor, I've grown up with pastors, because there's so many potholes and ditches you can find yourself in when teaching on tithing. You have uh, the pitfall of the law, you have did tithing predate uh, uh, Moses and, and is tithing in the New Testament, and there's so much stuff surrounding tithing that by the end of the message, you kind of feel like you should tithe. Mel Pastor Melanie gave a great scripture that I'll be referencing that we're supposed to tithe. It's, it's clear there, at least in Malachi. And so you feel like you should tithe, but let me tell you a secret about you. You don't have to admit it, but most would walk away saying, I'm not sure I understand why. Why tithe? God's not broke. Everything in Scripture talks about exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what we could ask or think. And does God really need my money? And you have Scriptures about robbing God. And, and, and at the end of it all, you think, I, I, I feel like I should tithe, but I'm not sure I totally understand tithing. So here's two questions I want to answer for you this morning. One, why did God institute tithing? Why? And number two, who is tithing meant for? Why institute tithing, and who is it meant for? And, and can I serve this up like one of those Korean chefs that does the slicing in front of you and passes you just a bit, and after you've eaten that, I pass you a bit more? Can I do that? So, so why did God institute tithing and who is it meant for? The impression that we have on tithing today, maybe you don't, but the impression that we have is that tithing is meant for the pastor and the church. That's what we think oftentimes. The tithing, we know tithing goes to the church. And we bring our tithes to the church and we have kind of an understanding that we have to pay salaries and we have to take care of the operations of the local church. Is this okay? There's nothing wrong with that, is there? But if we stop there, you have partial truth. Oh, man. And partial truth is a full lie. Lord, help me this morning. You have partial truth. And what happens is, if the pastor and the local church receive all the tithes as unto themselves, you have no limit to how wealthy the pastor can become. You have no limit to how well you can decorate a building. And all the money is able to flow to the operations of the local church which is okay. The only problem is it's not biblical. It's partially biblical. And the partial here is really important to catch. And there's a reason nobody's preached this to you. Because the operations of the organization are paramount in a pastor's mind. And, you know, you get the good stuff here. Most pastors have a certain personality type. They're type A or they're type whatever. And so there's sometimes a bit of a eh, uh, attached to pastors and leaders, especially when it comes to money. And there's nothing wrong with being aware and in control of, 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 of the money. So we know that that's partially true, that it goes to the operations of the local church. Now, Here's the principle and the secret I want to give you this morning as we taxi. 
In the Old Testament, when it came to the workings of the temple, the operations of the temple, which were a prophetic type of the local church, everyone brought a tenth to the temple. But the tenth was split up. And this is the part you, you probably haven't heard. A portion of the tenth that was brought, a portion of the tithe was meant for the operations of the temple, modern day church, but a whole other part of the tithe, and this will rock your world, was to go to the fatherless, the widows, the orphans, and the poor. Now, the reason you're not taught that is because as soon as you announce that, people start giving 5% to the local church, and they give another 5 to some TV ministry or something on the street and all of that. But I've got I've to hold you to biblical standard here, and I'll walk you there. Take my hand. Pray for me, dear, this morning, please. (laughs) A portion of the tenth that everyone brought to the house was meant for the operations of the temple or the local church. And another part of the tithes was for the fatherless, the widows, the orphans, and the poor, and even the foreigners, the aliens. Now, after people brought their tithes, the percentage was split up. And, and some was given to the priest and the workings of the temple, the others to the fatherless, widows, orphans, and poor. Now, Nehemiah 10 specifically says, and this part is important, ne- Nehemiah 10 specifies that a portion shall be for the house of God. Amen? Are we in the house of God? A portion shall be for the house of God. And it actually says, so so you can't get away with it here. Do not neglect, because God is a God of practicality and common sense, it says do not neglect the house of God. Are we clear? Don't neglect the house of God for the sake of whatever else you're doing. So some went to the house of God and the rest went to a place called the storehouse. (laughs) There was the temple, and then there was the storehouse. Most churches blur those lines quite well, and you go, and you're compelled to give your tithe, and you don't even know if they have a storehouse. You just think, if I give, I'll get. I I better give so I can get something. So our motives even are all wrong. And the pastor will use that. The leader will use it. If you give, give, don't rob God. You're going to go to hell. So there's two threats you get. One is you're not going to be blessed, which is partially true. And the second is you're going to go to hell. And and we're compelled and pushed to give a tenth of our income. And I believe that you don't have to say either of those if you show people what tithing is for. Can I continue? So some went to the house of God. Let everyone say house of God. And the rest went to the storehouse. And the storehouse was for those in need. The storehouse was for the fatherless, the orphan, the widow, those who are needy. Here's the principle that God was operating on. God knew that in any society, there will be inequality, hardship, crisis, people who are poor, disenfranchised, broken, and those who lack. God knew this. So God wanted to build into society through the church the values of love and empathy and care and mercy and justice. God wanted the church 
to be the place in all of society that you could go to to find help, equality, what you could have your needs met. He made the church that beacon. We've done some of the opposite, haven't we? He's made the church the beacon of hope and light for where people could come if they had need and find empathy, care, mercy, and justice. Are there some people in our society that need justice? Are there some people that need empathy? God set up, this is literally how it worked, God's kingdom, God set up a welfare system and made it so that anyone could could help those in need through the storehouse of the local church. God set up a system so that all of us, there was literally a vehicle by which we could meet the needs of the poor, underprivileged, disenfranchised, those that Jesus loved. He said, how can I meet their needs? Ah, I'll set up a storehouse. I'll set up the church. The church will have a storehouse by which society's needs can be met and I can be glorified. So where there is the absence of a church with a storehouse, you have the absence of God meeting needs in the society. It's not God's problem, it's your problem. And I'll show this to you. It's literally in our human wiring to meet the needs of society through the local church. I have been getting calls since we started this church. One was from a witch who practices occult. and She has a business. And she said, I know what my practice is, but I know that if I don't give 10% to the church, I can't be blessed, is what she said. So I said... We will take your money, and we will minister to you, and we're ministering to her. There's another person who has a business. They don't go to church. They're not a Christian, but they they said, I'm looking for somewhere to give my money that will meet the needs of people, and so they look for a church. Lord, help me. Even the unsaved instinctively know that we are to love one another, that we are to love our neighbor, and they look for a place to put their money to meet needs. And when they find a church, make sure the church has a storehouse, because that's the only way you're going to know money is meeting people's needs. Are you with me this morning? They don't necessarily come to church, but they want to give through the church. The church is to be the vehicle by which God meets society's needs. Can I get an amen? So by doing this as a church, God was essentially saying, orphans, widows, fatherless, those in need, church, you take care of them. It's your job. Oh man, dear, how am I doing? Not the government. No, 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 no. I know some poor people that will not obtain wealth through what the government will give. God bless our government and pray for our government. But they can come into the church and find a job through Bernice. They can find food. They can find clothing. They can find exactly what they need. There is a lighthouse in the city, and it's the local church with the storehouse. Can I get an amen? God is saying, church, you take care of them. He's announcing, are there any widows in Oshawa? I have a system to take care of you. Are there any single mothers in Oshawa? There's a place you can go. (laughs) I know you haven't heard me. God is up up in heaven. He's saying, I know you haven't heard me, but there's a place you can go. Are there any homeless in Oshawa? There's a place. I've set up a system for you. A kingdom welfare system to meet your needs. Are there children that don't have parents or don't have meals? I have a place set up for you. We've done church all wrong.
I feel it's too much for us this morning. I asked your permission and you gave it. <laughs> By the way, sensitive side note, but if you have wealthy people in your church, the goal of a wealthy person coming to your church is not for you to chase them down to get money from them. I love these pastors and these pastors and bishops with the wealthy in their church with all the perks and everything. If you have a wealthy person in your church, it means you can reach more people. So we have to ask the question, what is the storehouse? What is a storehouse? For the Jews in those days, and I, I only saw this when I was in Philippines, which was fascinating when it came to tithing. But for the Jews, it wasn't paper money all the time. There was actually tangible products. It wasn't necessarily money. They, they, they needed a place to store everything that they brought. Sheep, cattle, donkeys and money, whatever, and, and, I, and, and they all brought their animals to church, and it was about as noisy as it is in here. <laughs> they all brought their animals to church, and they said, okay, we're all giving these towards the local church temple, and to meet the needs of the poor all around us, so we need to make a storehouse, and they had a storehouse which is simply a place to store things. A percentage went to the house of God. The rest went into the storehouse. Now, in Philippines, some of those from the more rural areas, when it came to their Sunday of first fruits or tithing, you'd see somebody walk into church with a chicken. People might come in with eggs or with whatever their tenth was. But in our culture, we are blessed to be able to combine all of our first fruits or our tithe into money. Money that can be given online, money that can be given at the back, and all of that. And we have a storehouse, which is a bank account. It's a storehouse for what is, what is brought in, okay? So it's a storehouse. We have a bank account. Now, watch this. Hence why Pastor Melanie read this this morning. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Is God hungry? Think about that. God needs a meal? What's going on here? Stay with me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Here's the question. Why does God need food in his house? It's because God has children. It's because God has children. And you think God's children are, are, are limited to those who show up to a building once a week for two hours? No siree, I've seen God's children all over the street. Are you catching this? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food. Here's the purpose of tithing. God's saying, I need food in my house. Why, God, are you hungry? No, I've got a lot of hungry mouths to feed. The tithe is meant to pass through the house of God and get to those who are hungry. Shandaraba. I, I got goosebumps because this gets so exciting. And then he says, and try me now in this. Test me, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough in your storehouse to receive it. So here, here begs another question. Well, Lord, if, you, if you're capable 
of pouring out from heaven abundance into our storehouse, why do we have to give a percentage? It's because the things of the Spirit must operate in partnership with the things on earth. There has to be agreement. So when we show our agreement, and here's the other reason, if God, do you know God's capacity? Have you ever met a billionaire? I have small potatoes compared to God's capacity. And, and God knows that if he opens up the floodgates of heaven and pours it out on people who don't know how to give, you will use it to enrich yourself. You'll use what he pours out to enrich yourself, and you'll still neglect those who need it. So God tests the church to see if he can flow through them to those who need it. So he tests you with a tenth. He says, how can I make it as small as possible? I don't need your money. I need to test your heart. And if I can find people that can part with 10, and it's not good to have 100% of everything, I'll tell you. But if I can find people who can give 10, then I can trust them to open up the greater wealth and the greater floodgates because the purpose of tithing is to flow through the church, not to the church. So he has no problem with giving you more than enough. His problem is some of you won't give even what you have. So he won't unlock it for you. Now, here's where it gets fun. Did you know that that scripture that Pastor Melanie read this morning is Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10? We all quote it. You know it off by heart, probably. <laughs> if you've come from church, it's like, well, I better give my tenth. But did you know Malachi 3, verse 5? Just a few scriptures back that say, Then I will come near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness to, against sorcerers, the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, and those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, or the widow, or the orphan, and those who turn away the foreigner. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I'm trying to tell the church this for years. But those who oppress the poor, who don't take care of widows... Like, let's just get real here. Can I take my pastor hat off? <laughs> Orphans. And those who are foreigners, they're new, they don't have. Those who oppress and don't meet their needs get right up there in the list with sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers. And I'll tell you why. I didn't write it. I wouldn't have written it. But he wrote it. For some reason, God cares about people. And when we don't care about people, it's a gross violation. So when you read Malachi 3 verse 10, you've got to read it in context with verse 5 that God is interested in, in not oppressing those who are poor, needy, widowed, all of that. God is interested in reaching them, and then guess what he does in verse 10? Introduces tithing. I'm laying out a case here, and I'll go to bat with anybody on this, because I believe it's the truth. Am I talking the truth, Pastor Andrea? So tithing, here's the principle I want you to write down, even if you don't understand it yet. Tithing was a way of judging the spirit of oppression and poverty. Wherever there is the poor, the weak, the oppressed, the broken, those in lack, what kingdom is that of? It's the kingdom of darkness. 
So every time you give a homeless person a hot meal, you are judging and dethroning the kingdom of darkness and enthroning another kingdom. That's why you don't make a big deal. Like that pastor. They wanted me to come in and teach on seven mountains and we're going to take over this and we're going to take over that. And she said, we don't really feel called to meet the needs of the poor. We feel called to the, the business people. And I say, well, business people have poverty too. Mental poverty, emotional poverty, spiritual poverty. But the mindset, the mindset of what we have done to those who are in need. The neglect. And God cares so much about them. He says, well, if the church won't do it, I'll work through unsaved people to do it. So every time you, you hug a depressed person, you're dethroning the kingdom of darkness and enthroning another kingdom and judging the spirit of depression. Every time you give somebody a dollar, give them a glass of water, every time you help somebody in need, you are, you are having a kingdom clash, an eternal kingdom clash between good and evil. Every time you honor someone who dishonors you, you are judging the spirit of Satan and enthroning another kingdom. Every time you tithe, you are judging the spirit of oppression. Unless your church uses all the tithe to make themselves fat. But if you don't understand this, you don't know what to do with the tithe but make yourself fat. Now, fast forward to the New Testament. <laughs> the New Testament doesn't cancel out tithe, because even Jesus alludes to tithing. It's still there. It doesn't cancel out tithes, but it enhances it. Every local church is to have a storehouse. And we see this, actually. And you say, where do we see this? They came during the revival and brought the money to the apostles' feet. And it was distributed so that there was no one lacking anything. <laughs> Once I understood this, I was so sickened by what some leaders have done with bring the money to the apostles' feet, as if it belongs to the apostle. Now, now let me show you something. Here's the principle. Everything is about the spirit of contribution, especially as an apostolic center that God wants to use to reach people. He's got to test us to see that it can flow through us. Every local church should have a storehouse. Everything is about the spirit of contribution. This is why we require, I mean, we have membership, but it's, we don't believe you get into heaven with our HMC membership, but we make it, tithing is one of those things. Why? Let me tell you why. It's not because we're afraid we can't afford something. You know the reason we've instituted tithing? It's not only so you can walk in blessing. But we want to reach people. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So, can I bring it home? Let me just take a water break, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm really enjoying this message. I'm ready for some people to leave over this. I'm ready to go all the way with this. I'm loyal to the truth before I'm loyal to any man. God knew that in every society there would be the poor, the widows, the broken, the needy, the fatherless. And so he set up a welfare system for them through the church. So when you get into Malachi chapter 3 verse 8, here's where it gets wild. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? 
in tithes and offerings. Now, when I would hear this, <laughs> I really struggled growing up. What do you mean, rob God? And even the uninspired header in my Bible, you know, you have headers in your Bible. Those, those are not written by God. Mine is so harsh. I read it last night. It says, do not rob God. <laughs> Does it say that in yours? <laughs> Don't rob God. I, I better tell this section. Don't rob God. Give me your wallet. <laughs> it hurts me more than it hurts you, but I'm taking your money. Am I okay, Bruce, and the people at the back? Let me just pose this very, un and I'm almost done. It's only 11.30. I'm almost done. Let me just pose this question to shake things up a bit. Who could rob God? If he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, if his kingdom is not even of this world, if he operates on a totally unique banking system, How could you ever steal from God? Let me answer your question with a question. How can you give to God? What do you buy for the guy that has everything? How can you rob God and what do you get for the guy that has everything? When I've been around some wealthy people and I go to buy them a gift or to give them some money, you know what they say? You know what would be a real gift for me is if you made a donation to someone in need. Now follow me here. How can you rob God if he has everything? And how can you give to God if he has everything? Well, the secret is found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 37 to 40. Are you ready? Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Naked or clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison or come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. How do you give to God? You give to God by giving to others. Therefore, how do you rob God? You rob God by holding back from giving to others. How do you rob God? What would constitute not giving your tithe as robbing? The reason you're robbing God when you don't give your tithe is because then you haven't given to the system that gives to others. Did you get it? When you give to others, this you did unto the least of these you did unto me. This you stole from the least of these you stole from me. The principle is this, when you refuse to give to the storehouse, you are robbing from others in need. Therefore, you are robbing God. So we're compelled to give. And we're not giving because we're afraid. We're not, we're not giving because of a punishment of hell. Or we're not... We're not giving because we want to get something, even though we'll walk in blessing. We're giving because it's more blessed to give than to receive, and we want to give through the church to meet people's needs. We're actually Christians. So History Makers Church has a storehouse. Bring me up a little louder, Bruce. History Makers Church has a storehouse. Our storehouse is our new department called social initiatives. It's our department, our social initiatives. 
I was this close to instituting this at our former church. This was the final direction. To institute an entire department that would make the church have no walls and be reaching society in every area. We're going to do that through History Makers Church. I don't know of a better name than History Makers because you're making history in people's lives for Jesus. It's his story for Jesus. So far in our social initiatives department, we have Bernice and her ministry to the homeless. We have Cheryl Webb and Yvette and their ministry. I didn't invite you guys yet, but join us. <laughs> Yvette and Cheryl Webb, their ministry in the prison system. The prisoner, important to God's heart. We have Richard and Nicole Joyner with Camp Grace that takes young children and brings them to Christ, those in need, underprivileged, the needy. We have Bobby Joe and Jordan Moran and their ministry to the homeless and mothers and addicted and all that they're doing. And this is just the starting point. Out of this church, we want to produce at least a hundred programs like that in the next 10 years throughout the city of Oshawa. If there is a need, here we are. The church is here. We have a direction. We want to go with politics and involvement in every sector of society. And so what happens when you bring your, let's get real, when you bring your tithe into History Makers Church. Part of it, a portion of it, goes to the operations of the local church. It costs money to rent this beautiful thing. It goes to the operations of the local church, the Levites, the priests. But another portion of it goes to exactly what the Bible says, those who are in need goes to reaching society. So we're able to do this through our social department. Now we have alms where we can take any amount and give even to those who are in need among us. We have those who, are, who come on a Sunday who have need and we, we help them in that way through alms. That's part of the social department. But we also are to, just as they laid the money at the apostles' feet and it was distributed so that no one had any need, we're able to distribute finances through our social department Department, the Apostolic Council decides, not just Pastor Derek, we have a team that decides how the money is distributed and it's released to these programs that are clothing the, the, the naked, that are ministering to the widows, that are taking care of the children, that are meeting the needs of homeless. If there is any anything in the city of Oshawa and Durham region that does not reflect the kingdom of heaven, we are there to meet that need and we are backed up with the finance that come into the storehouse can I get an amen? amen so in Acts and I close with this in Acts chapter 4 verse 34 and 35 nor was there anyone among them that lacked I'll just give you a Bible nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all were possessors of lands or houses sold to them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each as anyone had need. So, in the, principle, uh, in the New Testament, and by the way, what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Have you ever wondered why? It wasn't that they weren't tithers. You get funny with God's money, you're going to pay for that. You're robbing God. You store up your houses, you're this, you're that. Don't you know tonight your soul is demanded of you? In the New Testament, a curse in the context of giving when we're supposed to be generous doesn't have to look like Ananias and Sapphira. I'll tell you what the curse looks like. Do you want to know what the curse is for those who refuse to give? 
It means you will lack. The New Testament curse. You don't even have to call it curse. And here's where all the scriptures really matter. And I take authority over every unclean spirit in this room. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, the curse for not giving and having what I call the spirit of stingy (laughs) is you will lack. You will miss out on the open heavens. You will wake up one morning and say, life is hard. And all through the New Testament, give and it will be given unto you. Those who give in abundance will get in abundance. Those who hold back, it says it. This is scripture. And I want us to remember something. Because now you should know it. When you give your tithe, yes, you're giving to God, but you're actually giving to those that God loves. You are a need meter through your tithe. Can I get an amen? Stand with me this morning.